secured for us in Jesus Christ. The good news is that wherever you have been, whatever you have done, no matter how wrong it's gone, no matter how big the mess may be, the way home is made available. It's there for you. It's already done. The price is paid. It's taken care of. And you, hear this, you are forgiven. The forgiveness of sins is declared in the name of the Christ. What Jesus has done for you secures your forgiveness. You don't have to do anything to make Him say, okay, well, you're worth that. All you had to do to become worth that is to be born in the image of God. And then, I guess, blow it. You don't need forgiveness unless you're a sinner. And yet, sin can be left behind. That's the heart of the Gospel, right? That's how we, we... This is free. The waters of baptism don't cost you anything. And you don't have to do anything to get ready for it. You just have to hear the Gospel and say, I want that. I want to be forgiven. I'm tired of trying to do it myself on my own. And I'm tired of all my sin being all over me and all these feelings of, of wretchedness and guilt. Well, wash it away. Is right there. And that's what we do here. We wash it away. The blood of Christ Jesus continually cleansing us. It's at the very center of the Gospel. Forgiveness. And, and you can un wrestle with how to understand that. How does the cross make me forgiven? You know, is it by divine example? Where, where God is, is willing to let all of our wickedness fall on His Son? The worst that can be done. What can you do that's worse than murder somebody's child? Can you think of something worse than that? And that's what happened. So if God can forgive that, and immediately upon His resurrection, Jesus starts talking about forgiveness. Immediately. So if God can forgive that, what can I do that's worse than that? And so the cross comes as message to say, you can be forgiven. Absolutely you can. Because the one we killed pronounced it to us. Or you can look at it as uh, penal substitutionary theory. That's a big word. That basically says you're in the dock. You're on trial. And you're guilty. You did the crime. But someone else steps in for you and says, I'll bear the punishment for that person. I'll take it. Let them go free. And I'll take it. That's one theory that helps us understand. So on the cross, Jesus is, is suffering our punishment so that we might be forgiven and go free. There's a theory that says Christus Victor, which means that Christ has declared victory over sin and death. He has defeated Satan. And in His resurrection, He has defeated it all. So the things that we were going to be punished for have been triumphed over. They have been pushed away. And our forgiveness is secured kind of in a battle. A battle that He fought to rescue us and to liberate us. There's a theory that says, well, this was His crowning, His, his coronation. Coronationary redemption. And that shows up in the book of Hebrews which says that He was crowned with glory in His suffering. And a king can offer pardons. And so he does. This crowned victorious king offers you pardon. However you want to try and figure it out. Somehow what Christ has done for us has secured our absolute forgiveness. And you know, there are about half a dozen more theories about how that thing worked. How the cross and the resurrection combined together to say, my sin is gone. I'm going to be satisfied with the truth that it is. The reality that no matter what you've done, in fact, no matter what you're struggling with right now, you may be in a bad place right now. You're already forgiven. The prodigal, when he lifted up his eyes, was already forgiven by the dad. He just wanted him to come home. 
That's, that's where you are. By the way, if you're in a bad place, don't take forgiveness as an excuse to stay there. Get up. Come home. But, and certainly don't let your guiltiness, your shame, prevent you from receiving the good news of God. You are forgiven. Live forgivenly. We want that to be the Gospel, don't we? Because find me the person who doesn't have something that bothers them. You know, I actually sat by somebody on an airplane once who told me, you Christians, you're all worried about guilt and shame. Of course, you, know, you don't want to sit by me on an airplane. I'm going to talk to you about God. You know? <laughs> but uh, I'm sitting by this guy, and he's like, you're all worried about guilt. I don't feel guilty at all. And then he told me about his life. And I thought, you may not feel guilty. <laughs> Brother, you ought to, man. So I've met people who have their consciences burned away, but I haven't met anybody who has an active conscience and who's aware of who they are and what they've done who doesn't have pain. I've never met that. We want forgiveness to be in the heart of God. You know, sometimes that's kind of where we want it to stay. Let the forgiveness be there. I don't know that I want it here. I might be willing to forgive if the person who wronged me comes and grovels sufficiently. I might be willing to forgive if I have the assurance that the bad thing is never going to happen again. And the thing that they did to me, that was, that's done. They never get to wrong me again. Fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice. Burn yourself. That's in the Bible somewhere, right? Fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, shame on you. Fool me three times, I'm getting a baseball bat. That, that, isn't that somewhere? You know, we love our grudges. You know that? We define ourselves by what we do not forgive so very often. That other person's wrong helps us to feel good about ourselves. I'm just. I'm good. Because I didn't do that. I'm better than they are. And we carry these pains as part of our identity. So often our parents and their failures become our inabilities to forgive. And we walk with these hatreds and we walk with these pains and we carry them. And folks, they're precious to us. I know they're precious to us because the moment you say to somebody, you know, your life would be better if you would put, them that, put that down. The moment you say that, what you'll see here is, how dare you? How dare you ask me to... Don't you realize what a big deal this is? Don't you realize how badly I've been hurt? Don't you know that my personhood has been undone and I can't be put together? Don't you know that part of the reason you can't is that you won't set it down? You know, I would never tell you to forgive that. You fill in the blank. Whatever it is that's bothering you, whatever pain or shame you've got, I would never tell you to forgive it. I wouldn't. I've run into people who, uh, who have been raped. And I would never tell them to forgive their rapist. I've met people who have been divorced, who carry the bitterness of their, their ex-spouse's behaviors and all the ways that they wronged them. And I would never tell them, you should forgive that. I wouldn't. I've met people who have had loved ones murdered. And I would never say, you should forgive that. I wouldn't, because I don't want to be a hypocrite. Because, folks, somebody says something mean about me, and I stew on it for a week. Forgiveness is hard. It is so very hard. Because when you forgive, what you have to do is you have to say to the one who has wronged you, I will bear all of the pain for what you have done. And I will charge none of it to you. I won't hold any of this against you. 
I won't define you by the evil you have done, but I will look for God in you. Because somewhere it's in there. I would never tell anybody to do that. But God does. It is one of God's hardest commands. Forgive. Whatever it is, forgive it. Open the fists of your heart and let it go. Release it. Turn it loose. Set the prisoner free. And I tell you what, Jesus is not kidding around when He says this. He's not joking. In fact, Jesus will attach to forgiveness your salvation. What do you mean? There's there's nothing I can, can do to save myself. I can't save myself. Congratulations, you're a good Christian. You've got great theology. Well done. Except, I'm going to believe the Lord. Maybe you can't do anything to save yourself, but there are things you can hang on to that cost you stuff. It may even cost you eternity. But certainly they begin costing you stuff right here, right now. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, For if you forgive men their debts, your Heavenly Father will also forgive your debts. But if you will not forgive men their debts, neither will your Heavenly Father forgive you yours. You know, I don't know about you, but I don't really like the picture of God that that paints, at least not on the surface. It makes God almost seem kind of petty, doesn't it? Do it my way, or, you know, I've got all this power, and if you don't do it my way, well, fine, I'm going to charge it against you. I'm going I'm to hold this grudge if you don't stop holding your grudge. Is that what Jesus means? Remember what the overall meaning of this sermon is. For the last several months, this year, we have been looking at the Sermon on the Mount. And what Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount is that He is encouraging your heart to come back home to the heart of God. He is telling you what the law was given for in the first place. Why did God give a law? Why did He set a set of rules in front of us? A set of demands, commandments. Why did He give us those? He gave us those because our hearts are so very estranged from His. We are so different from Him. He loves with ease. He forgives with ease. He welcomes His enemies to His own table. He invites the sinner into holiness. He is different from us. Would we do any of that? Which of us would love those who murdered our kids? He is so different. So he gives this law to say, behave like this. But of course, the purpose of the law was to give it to us so that we might meditate on it and say, what kind of a heart would be like that? What kind of person would live naturally this way? And of course, the Pharisees, they messed it all up and they made it about behaviors and not hearts. Keep these rules. Don't lust. Or rather, don't commit adultery. Now, you lust all you want to. Just don't act on it. Don't kill anybody. Get as mad as you want to. But don't kill anybody. And love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's the way it's supposed to work. The commandments love your neighbor. But your enemy's not your neighbor, is he? All these things that have nothing to do with the nature of the heart we're supposed to have. And so Jesus comes and says, no, 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 no. What kind of heart would be like this? What kind of heart would give you this commandment in the first place? Get beneath the commandment and have the heart that not only has... Have the heart that you could say, don't commit adultery, and you'd go, well, duh. Yeah, I don't even lust. I I have the relationship I've got, and, and that's enough. That's more than enough. Because I'm committed in love to that person. Don't murder. Well, duh. Of course I won't murder because that's the image of God. It may be the misbehaving image of God, but it's still the image of God and we're not going to kill it. Don't lie. 
Yeah, I know. You know, you don't have to be told once you have the heart of God. Remember where we started this sermon. It is at the heart of the gospel. Forgiveness is. Because that is the heart of God. God is a forgiving God. I mean, if you insist on clinging to your sinfulness, and you say, no, I don't want to be forgiven, I want to prove myself, well, maybe He'll let you do that, but it won't work out well for you. But it is in the nature of our God to say, cut it out. Come to me. Let me heal you. Let me help you. I am a forgiving God. Well, if that's the heart of our God, what should your heart be like? If you know that God can forgive anyone of anything, you know that's true. You celebrate it over and over again. Then what should the disciple of Jesus be like? What should the heart of the Christian be like? It should be a heart prepared to forgive. Jesus teaches over and over and over again about forgiveness. You know the story about the, the guy who owes so much money. I mean, it dwarfs our national debt, which is saying something. And the king just forgives him, right? And what does he do? He goes out and he finds someone who owes him about $30,000, which is not nothing. Jesus never trivializes the cost of forgiveness. It'll cost you something to forgive. About $30,000 is what that guy owed. 200 denarii? About $30,000. And he grabs him by the throat and chokes him. Give back what you owe me. And the king ends up throwing that guy into prison and he says, that's what the Lord will do to each of you if you don't forgive to your, from your heart. Why? Why would he do that? Because he doesn't have the heart of the king. He doesn't have the heart of the king. And people who don't have the heart of the king, it's not that God can't forgive. It's that they aren't fit for heaven. They wouldn't enjoy it there. They wouldn't fit in. And, and Peter, Peter comes to Jesus one time and says, Now, Lord, how many times do I need to forgive my brother? Seven times? And Jesus, Peter's been very impressive because what he's done is he's grabbed what the Pharisees say, which is three. Three major sins you've got to forgive. After that, no. He's doubled it and he's added one. No, he's really impressive. Not to the Lord, though. The Lord says, no, 70 times. Seven. Raised to a power, you know, raised, not raised to a power of ten. Multiplied by ten, and then multiplied by itself. 490 times. Incidentally, if you have a notebook that you're carrying around and you, it has hash marks in it, you've missed the point. Because the point is raised to a power of ten. You're supposed to lose count. You're just supposed to practice forgiveness and practice it over and over and over and over again. Jesus will say if someone comes to you over and over and over again in the same day, they sin against you, they come back and they say, I'm sorry, you're supposed to forgive them immediately. Over and over the same day. You're like, are, are you not learning anything? How can you keep sinning against me? And God's looking at you and saying, are you not learning anything? Because the practice of forgiveness trains your heart to become different. Can you imagine being a person incapable of holding grudges? Where grudges became slippery in your hands. You just had to put them down. Who couldn't remember wrongs. Who could, who could just dismiss the worst things. How much easier would it be for you to love people if it just came naturally to you to forgive people? When Jesus says, forgive or you won't be forgiven, I don't think it's because God's a God who keep, holds grudges. I think Jesus is telling us the toxicity of our refusal to forgive and what it does to our hearts. When we carry a grudge, we become less like God. And each time we reflect upon that grudge, we are more like Satan, who is locked in hate, 
who is trapped there. You don't want to be trapped there. So whatever it is you hold on to, you need to let it go. And this is so toxic that I think God looks at us and says, if you don't become a person who forgives, then you are alien to my nature. And the whole point of everything that I've done since it all went wrong in the garden is to woo people back. To come and participate in the nature of the Trinity. Honestly, do you think Jesus holds a grudge against his dad? You realize he asked him for something he didn't get. He said, deliver me from this. And God said, no. You think Jesus is mad at him about it? It was a pretty awful experience, wouldn't you agree? Probably a pretty hard thing to put down. Anybody here think that he had trouble with it? Not at all. Because it's in his nature to love. It's in his nature to welcome. I mean, he forgave you and me. He forgets in his nature. It's who he is. It can be in your nature too. Good grief, how do I get there? Talk about your tall order. It's really beautiful and easy to talk about as long as you leave it in theory. But the minute you say, yeah, but what my dad did. Yeah, but what my wife did. Yeah, but what my coworker did. What my boss did. I mean, he promised me that raise. And he gave that promotion to a pretty girl. <sighs> uh-uh. You know what? That, man, Christmas was awful that year because I planned everything based on that promotion. It didn't come through. No way. That bully that beat up my son. Are you kidding? As long as you leave it in theory, it's all nice and beautiful. But when you actually have to practice it, pain comes, which is why we don't want to do it. It hurts to forgive. It feels like death. It is death. You, after all, were called to the cross. Right? If anyone would come after me, let him take up his cross. That's an instrument of death. Deny himself. The part of you that doesn't want to do this. Follow him. Be like Jesus. It feels like death. How on earth do I survive death? I go to God. This actually, this discipline of forgiveness that Jesus demands of us is actually one last word about prayer. Because he has just said that he's taught you to pray, the, 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 our Father, the Lord's Prayer. And in there is that prayer petition where you say, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And what Jesus is saying when he calls us to this discipline of forgiveness is to say, live consistently with your prayers. What you say to God, live in your life. The way to do it is to say it to God. That's how you forgive. There's a woman named Corrie Ten Boom. You ever heard of Corrie Ten Boom? She spent some time in, in World War II in a concentration camp. And after the war was over, she went around giving inspirational talks about the power of forgiveness. About how the, the, she was able to overcome everything, every trouble that all this had done to her by forgiving. While she was walking out through the audience, she ran into, she's shaking people's hands, and someone grabbed her hand and said, Ja, Fräulein, is not forgiveness wonderful? She looks up and here's one of her prison guards. One that she remembered as a particularly detestable and horrible person who had done sadistic and terrible things. And she realized that even though she had just been up in front of all these people talking about forgiveness, she herself could not do it. She simply couldn't. She looked at this man and all of her hate whirled up in her heart. And she thought, I can't do it. So what she did is she said, God, please forgive this man because I cannot. And the moment she prayed that prayer, she found that she could. 
The way to forgive is to go to God with your inability to forgive. You carry your grudge to Him. The pains that you have been given, the the failures of your family, the rape, the murder, the stealing, the oppression, whatever it is that is so heavy on you, you take it to God. And you say, God, I can't forgive this. Tell Him the truth. God, this is too much. It hurts too bad. And you keep giving it to Him until you discover that you're lying. You keep offering Him your inability to forgive, and He will keep offering you His ability to forgive. And it will work in you like leaven in bread until your heart has changed. Because that's the power of God. He can change you. Well, not me. Really? You think what, what you're facing is more challenging than the tomb of His Son? Because Jesus was dead. He wasn't kind of hurt a little bit. He was dead. And God raised Him from the dead. And if He can handle that, He can handle your stubborn heart. He can help you to overcome Whatever it is. And folks, I have seen it happen. Marriages that were falling apart, resurrected. People who hated a dead person, long dead, who was keeping them bound up, freed. You know, when you forgive, you set a prisoner free. It's not the other person. It's you. When you forgive, a new heart lives within you. When you forgive, the resurrection is at work within you. When you forgive, the dead live and the dead is you. This is why Jesus cares about it so much that He'll even offer something of a threat. Do this. Because it's it's connected to your forgiveness. Participate in your forgiveness by being a person who forgives others. Participate in the truth of the Gospel. The reality of the forgiving God needs to be born in you. That you become His forgiving image. That you show other people what God is like, not just with your words, but with your behavior, and with your heart, and with everything that you are. And when they see your good works, they will give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Especially those who have wronged you when they see you loving them anyway, they will see the glory of God at lie, alive within you. One last word and I'm done. Sometimes the hardest person to forgive is not outside of your skin. Sometimes the hardest person to forgive is you. You see that when you're trying so hard to make it better. You're going to fix it all. Or you see that when you give in to despair. You absolutely collapse and decide nothing can be fixed. Hear the Gospel of God and cut that out. God is a forgiving God. And He wants forgiveness to be experienced by you. And that includes by you. That you should set the prisoner free that is you. The way to do that is to believe the Gospel. Believe it. The dead can live again. The unforgivable is forgiven. It is all put away. Whatever it is you deal with, is done. Just come back to God. Let Him breathe life into you again. Walk again in newness of life because it's paid for. It's yours. And He wants you to have it. How are you doing with this? Are you living a life that echoes the heart of God? Does your heart beat with His heartbeat? Do you forgive the way He forgives completely? As if it never happened? Washing it away? Caring and loving the other person just because they're... Are you able to do that? Most of us are on a continuum somewhere. But are you even working at it? That thing you've thought of a couple of times when I've been talking here? How are you doing with that? It may be that you need the help of the church because sometimes it needs a group of people to pray together before the prisoner can be free. 
We're willing to do that. We'll pray with you. It may be that you came to this place with suffering in your heart that has nothing to do with what I'm talking about at all, but you, you need the compassion of the church, and if that's you, let us know. And it may be that you came here with filth all over you. This water's clean, relatively. But what it represents is absolutely clean because it is the death of Christ, and you can enter into the death of Christ in baptism and be washed clean not just your body getting the dirt off of it, but your soul getting the dirt off of it. You can be clean. Are you? If today you need the prayer, the compassion of the church, you want baptism, we'll wait on lunch. If this morning you're subject to the invitation of God, why don't you come right now while we stand and sing?